Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the next session um, from the High Level Conference on Drones. And today, we'll be talking to you about CESAR, U-Space, and UAM demonstrations. And um, before we get you on to the, uh, the main uh, feel of the program, don't forget that all questions are through the uh, Slido code you should be familiar with by now. Uh, the code unique for this session is on the screen at the moment. And this is good for all of you in the room and anyone watching online as well. Welcome to all. It's great to be face to face and see so many of you here. Today, we'll be talking about demonstrating urban air mobility within the CESAR program. Now, before I hand you over to my much more expert speakers than myself, what I'd like to do is just to tell you a little bit there is to know about what is a CESAR demonstration, for those of you who may not have actually been involved. The CESAR program is the Single European Sky Air Traffic Management Research Program, and it is the technology pillar of the European uh, Union Single European Sky um, uh, program. And the idea is that we've been given the job of creating, nurturing, growing new space, and as time has gone on, to expand it to cover um, uh, urban air mobility. And we do that through a number of types of research, industrial research, exploratory research, and through demonstrations. The demonstrations exist to allow us to do one of two things broadly. One is to get a solution which has been validated, maybe in a smaller scale, and bring lots of people in to scale it up, make sure there aren't any nasty surprises when you try and um, uh, deploy it on a large, on, on, with, with more participants. Or to pick a, a nice idea that really needs to be fast-tracked to deployment through trying and error, through bringing all the stakeholders together by flying, by trying, and to, see, and, and to see what you can achieve in a relatively short time. And really, that's where we are with the, with the use space demonstrations. You'll note from earlier use space work, we had a parallel track of exploratory research and demonstrations with our first 19 projects. Um, and then we come to the CESAR 2020 program, which we're just in at the moment, we're just completing at the moment. And these demonstrations are part of the CESAR 2020 program. Now, these will be due to be completed at the end of this year or early into next year. And our, our speakers will each be covering uh, one of these programs and talking about the whole initiative um, collectively. You should know that the CESAR 3 program, you may have seen now with the CESAR 3 joint undertaking, um, has started very recently. And we are start, we've just um, had a call um, underway for a new set of use space uh, demonstrations. And uh, uh, on uh, next week, on the 7th of April, will be another call coming out for industrial research and exploratory research, uh, which was announced earlier um, this morning. So um, the CESAR 3 program is getting underway. Lots more um, projects. Um, and I think for, uh, for drone research, it adds another 100 million or so to the pot, which um, is, is obviously very useful for, uh, for helping us to do, get things going. The current ones we're just uh, e evaluating at the moment are specifically aimed at demonstrating the U1 and U2 services that are needed to deploy the regulation as currently written. So it's there to stimulate, to build, to help the demonstration um, to grow. So we have here four speakers. I've had the privilege of working with these gentlemen over, over many years with, um, uh, with, with a number of our demonstrations in the past, and each of whom are a senior representative from one of their own uh, demonstrations. So, um, with no further ado, I'd like to hand over each of these. Um, each each of my speakers will start off with a uh, a short briefing and about their projects and about their uh, view of the world, and then we'll get into a discussion. Um, of course, I've got some uh, pre-canned subjects I'd like to cover, but I also welcome questions from the floor, and I don't mind how complicated they are because it's not me that's going to answer them, is it? So uh, please look forward to receiving your questions. Please enjoy the presentations, and I'd like now to hand over to, uh, to Andrew Hately from Eurocontrol, who, whose face you'll have seen on several other panels um, through this event as he's a, um, a, 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 key f a key player in the development of the youth space world, and uh, uh, well, you'll find out why. I'll, I'll shut up now. So, uh, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, I have some PowerPoint, which I forgot what's in it, so let's see where we go. So, the, the Chorus project ran from 2017 to 2019, and the Chorus project uh, wrote a concept of operations for youth space. And after we'd finished, we realized that there was going to be more work to do, 
and we looked around for an opportunity to continue the work. And a call was launched by Robin and Cengiz and co for looking at how um, the needs of urban mobility would impact use space. So we launched the Chorus XUAM project, which was the, the same team extended a little. And we've ended up now with 30 participants in the project. So if, if you see all their logos are there, we, we span quite a wide part of Europe. We have um, s six focus areas, which I'll come to shortly. Um, the, Chorus pro the Chorus XUAM project is really uh, trying to attack four different things. We, we're going to look at what needs to be done to um, extend the co um, use space to make it support urban air mobility, what needs to be modified a bit and made more mature, uh, and then we're going to try and demonstrate these extensions in six exercises. So um, a quick summary of these six exercises on one page. They're occurring in, in, in fact, seven locations. Um, in Belgium, we will do a, uh, an exercise which is based on first response. Uh, we will be flying in um, three areas where we'll be si simulating emergency responses, or, or there's quite a long story coming about that. In uh, Germany, we will carry out a flight with an with a, um, EV toll, uh, the Volocopter, uh, it says they're Bruchal. It's actually be a Kochstetter, which is the DLR test site. And we will then transform the location of that flight to simulate a flight from Frankfurt Airport to Frankfurt Mess. And we will have another flight which we will transform to be a flight from Heathrow to London City Airport. And uh, that way we, we were not able to get permission to take a, a volocopter through the middle of Frankfurt, but we will be able to explore the needs of synchronization of um, UAM traffic with uh, an environment which is a CTR. In Work Package 8 in Italy, we will make a, a flight which will start off with a, a large cargo drone which will fly from a major airport to a kind of small regional airport and then we will transfer the cargo into a small drone which will go to the roof of a hospital. Uh, that will be real, that's not a simulated flight. In Spain, we have already carried out a demonstration. We were doing an urban delivery operation in Castel Defels, which is the site of the University Polytechnic of Catalonia, and uh, is actually just at the end of the runway of Barcelona Airport. So we were not just in the CTR, we were really in the way of the manned aircraft. They Again, we're a bit cagey about letting us fly over the city, so we were flying over the beach. But we were flying for three days, and we got some good results there. In Sweden, we'll make an intercity flight from Linköping to Norrköping, and we will be using a um, prototype of an EV toll. And this is a flight which will start in a CTR, will go into uncontrolled airspace, and will end in a CTR. And in France, we're setting up a number of experiments which will be based in the... Pontoise Airport, and we'll be flying several EV tolls in um, a series of exercises which show the use of a corridor for transportation purposes around the north of France. Each of these six demonstrations explores different problems and addresses how these problems are solved using what we've been developing. The project also includes, let's say, um, a, a group working on the CONOPS and, and on redesigning the services, and this CONOPS activity has become somewhat transversal in, in the activities of, of the CESAR joint undertaking, and we're now collaborating with other demonstration projects to take on board their ideas about what needs to be changed in the CONOPS. So I, I don't know if I have a little, to, without boring you too much, what's the maiden change in the CONOPS? There's a whole load of stuff about vertiports, particularly interactions with uh, planning, and the needs of contingencies. EV tolls, not to be dramatic, but they take off in a fuel emergency, or, uh, so we really need to be able to deal with them in the case that there's a problem. So EV tolls will continuously plan where they can go to in case of a problem, and uh, that requires capacity in vertiports that they will pass en route. And we're discussing how to coordinate that 
retention of some capacity to allow emergency landing. There's also quite some issues with synchronization of, of manned, traf uh, manned aviation with uh, eVTOL traffic. There was some discussion in the previous panel about putting vertiports in airports. If you do that, you have to ask yourself how the, the eVTOLs are going to get in and out of the flows of manned traffic coming and going to that airport. We've been looking at flight rules, haven't got on terribly well so far, and we've been looking at the airspace structure about how we organize the terminal area of eVTOL and things like that. Um, yeah, I told you about the VLDs. Okay, so Chorus XUM is up and running. Uh, we have a website. We welcome your participation, your comments, and your interest. Thank you. Was I too long? Not at all. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Just like to move on one slide and we can see. So, oh. We'd like to move on now to Jonas Schaumberg from, uh, he's from Robotics Expert. Now, they, um, Robotics Expert, um, I'll let Jonas tell you about the company, but um, formed part of one of our earlier demonstrations um, in uh, the Gulf of Finland, which was uh, one of the very first demonstrations to, search to show um, cross-border activities, which was very exciting for us, and, um, um, and, and also had a, a UEM vehicle land at Helsinki, I understand, or operated in Helsinki, which we were very proud of. The project is now continuing under Gulf of Finland 2, and so Jonas, here he is, tell you all about it. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you. Yes, my name is Jonas Schamber from Robots Expert. Indeed, we are a consultancy in urban air mobility, increasingly in mobility. And uh, it's a privilege to be here today. It's a very interesting uh, overall conference. This is what we, I call now post-COVID. We're coming out of the little holes we've been hiding in for two years and meeting each other. It's immensely inspiring. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to tell something about GOF2 integrated use space and ATM operations. Carrying on the tradition from GOF use space, the original 2019-2020 uh, project, we start from the use case. What is it that we want to get done? And then we look at the difficulties and how we can solve them. So reality of urban air mobility is not just about flying people around. It's about transporting sensors, goods for different kind, all city aviation inside cities, from city centers to suburbs and between cities. That's how we looked at it. So it's everything from the average tourist drone to air taxis and manned aviation. The reality of today is we are having an integrated airspace, whether we like it or not. We have helicopter operations in the same airspace as drones. Whether we you know, want to regulate that, but that's, that is reality. So we are looking on a wide variety of operations with very different operational characteristics. Some go from point A to point B. Some do a perimeter inspection going round, round and around a perimeter, some do photogrammetric inspections over large areas. They have different aircraft characteristics, fixed wing, VTOL, they have different endurance, they have different speeds, they have different maneuvering capabilities. But yet, we share the same airspace. So we collected uh, a consortium with ANSPs from three countries. We are planning flight demonstrations and have done them in four countries already. We have USSPs, we have SIS technology vendors, we have drone manufacturers, drone operators, we have weather and connectivity data, supplementary data suppliers in here, and overall uh, a, a wide variety of expertise. So what is the ultimate vision? The ultimate vision is that we see a convergence in air traffic management from the bottom up we have use space building it from the prerequisites of highly automated procedures between machines in the air talking to machines on the ground. And we see an increasing level of automation from the humans in the cockpit to the humans in the ATCs. And ultimately, these need to merge. And in the ATM master plan, an excellent backdrop for this discussion, it talks about increasing levels of automation. So we, we set out on an exploratory journey to see how far are we on the level of automation with individual use space services integrated with manned aircraft users in the same airspace, or how much do we need to be do front lobe integration, having humans being the integrators, and how much do we need to still keep things separate because we can't do even front lobe integration. GOF 1 was focusing on level 2 automation, GOF 2 about pushing how, how far are we on the journey towards level three and on to level four automation when humans are only optionally involved in the automation. 
to allow us to do some evolution around this journey, we set out to do uh, two waves of demonstrations. One, wave one last year, wave two happening the summer and fall of this year, plus a microwave. The microwave is a scalability demonstration. Ultimately, Gov is very much about uh, how can we go from one country to another, take the AIM data, take the CNS data, and make things talk together. This is what automation needs to have. We need to have interoperability, right? So already next week, we had the first trial between Denmark and Sweden. That's going to be simulated only, but we're going to have cross-border. We're going to have six cross-border operations. Uh, the longest is 160 kilometers. It's going to be with live traffic from Copenhagen Airport with both ANSPRI's multi-stakeholder approval of operation plans. How do we link two cities in a cross-border domain? The safety case isn't there to do a massive number of real flights in that kind of environment, but the systems we can really acid test in a simulator environment. So we are being smart about that. We are going to Riga in three weeks and doing real flights from the aerodrome with Air Baltic uh, Training Academy pilots at the same time in the air, sharing ADSB data, seeing situation awareness also in the air with air data links so that all aviators can, can share situation awareness, doing BVLOS flight in that setting, doing VLOS flight in that setting, doing multiple drone light flight 100 meters from the edge of the runway in the open category. That's possible in the regulation as long as the people behind the business agree on how to do it and the safety case carries. It's possible. So last year, we had successful flights in, in Tallinn CTR in Estonia. We had in Helsinki CTR as well, real and simulated flights, uh, unsegregated airspace, but, C, but um, ATC provided us with, with segregation. Had an agreement with, with ANSP, had an agreement with CAA, yeah, can do it. And when we were done, 15 minutes and the Airbus 350 comes underneath on you know, 200 feet altitude. A spectacular environment, everything is safe. Common procedures, outside SORA, but definitely SERA. Klagenfurt CTR, we tried our, our best to get the permissions to fly in, in an aerodrome, pushing the boundary, run out of time getting the permits in order, switched it over and made it into a massive dissemination event with over 100 participants in a virtual trial, where we also demonstrated for the first time connectivity coverage information with mobile networks. So we had different flight routes planned, Dimetor supplying uh, together with the local MNO information about connectivity along the way, and we saw, ah, red light, redesign, go around, good connectivity, do the flight. Massive, massive lessons learned. We were in Tartu with CTR. We were exposed to some of the realities of current regulation. It, it's so involved that not even, you know, everybody gets it right all the time. So we, in good faith, did BVLOS flight with an eVTOL five kilometer distance, or well, we could actually see it because it's fairly large anyway, but it was ultimately BVLOS, everything legal, but, uh, but some aftermath happened of uh, what, what, what is the transit rules and what are the current ASR rules and did we, yeah, and at the end of the day, everything was safe and, and, and nominal and we're really happy about that one. The interesting thing was, it was a restriction area. I was the Airbus. We had a morning briefing with the tower. Tower guys, I have a GA aircraft coming in 10. Can you do negative 15? Yeah, okay, 15, we land, GA comes. Can I take two more go taking off? Yeah, go ahead, we take off in 20. All right, they take off and we do 20 and we take. So we did not segregate the airspace. We separated the airspace through common procedures and through having the right kind of professionals behind. Not going into all of that, we had nice demonstrations in Poland, in Conco level, manned aircraft, different sites, really showcasing that mobile network needs more work. Also for connectivity for ground control stations, suddenly one operator a kilometer away said, ah, we lost internet connection. It came back four minutes later. That's a fairly large, the, the, the aircraft with mobile network, no problem. But the ground stations, some more work. Automation, probably needs some connectivity to work, yeah. So, and then we have Tallinn Helsinki, drone flight, manned flight, same airspace, up to 5,000 feet, meeting each other halfway, vertical separation, both enjoying U-space services, also the manned aircraft. So that's what we're gonna do more of this year. More deconfliction, other services, 
precision weather now cast with wind lidars, getting turbulence vector fields and other advanced services for basis of can you fly, is my performance sufficient for these gusts? The other guys can fly, they're heavier, I cannot. So some of the images from uh, last year having a corridor 10 kilometer wide up to 5,000 feet connecting two countries flying in use space with float planes, with BVLOS drones. My last point is relating to what's driving all of this. Interoperability Whoops. and, and common uh, and, uh, information exchange services. So there's two concepts, business service, information exchange service. So if you want to tell um, uh, telemetry between uh, drone operator to USSP to SIS and potentially to ATM or geofencing or whatever, we need to agree on the data formats and the connectivity. So Gov2 is showcasing SWIM compatible uh, information exchange services that, by the way, have been adopted as a starting point by PJ34 Aura project for ATM to SIS connectivity as well. So we've seen clearly in Gov1, and we see it clearly now too, that drone operation ground control stations, they need to be integrated to the USSP digitally. And to do that in a scalable way, we need to have common interfaces for them also, if, in, if the regulation isn't there to, to specify it yet. But it's a free market, and it's going to show, I think, that in order for us to have automation and integration, we need to share the same airspace, we need to share the same data with common interfaces and also with reliable digital uh, data links. So we already have six IEXs, or information exchange services, demonstrated. We're going to add three more this year. It's a fantastic journey. The next demonstration, live demonstration is in June in Finland. Welcome to Observe. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas, for that uh, very clear description of a very exciting project. Um, our next speaker is Michael Shamim, who is the, um, the, the CEO of Helicus. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce this because the, the project he's about to describe to you, Safi Ahmed, was such a perfect example of what a CESAR demonstration should be that we decided to have a showcase event with him just to demonstrate it in particular with a whole day and lots of experts and lots of senior people. But on the day before the event, the COVID rules change. And we put months of effort into this and COVID just said, no, go home. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Michael here to give him his chance to, to present, uh, present this project to us. Thanks, Robin. Uh, indeed, uh, it was, uh, we spent a lot of days together we did. to prepare that event. And, uh, but I think we can, uh, uh, how to say, uh, anyway, learn from that and, and use it in the next uh, uh, three events that we're actually planning as part of Sephirimet. Um, I'll press on the green button, yeah. Oh, so um, basically, um, uh, Roman introduced them, what VLD, um, very large demonstrator projects are. So it's very large because there's a lot of participants, a lot, um, la a lot of objectives. We'll come to that in the next slide. So we have 17 partners, eight countries. We also have an extensive advisory board, which is extremely important, international also, uh, where we have, let's say, uh, the different um, stakeholders also um, covering us. And um, the thing is that we're um, uh, talking about Safir Met. I'm sure many of you know the project Safar that happened in 2018-19. Until March 20, in fact. Um, uh, so we're actually building up and starting from um, an, an, a kind of ecosystem of partners that not only works together in project but also throughout. That uh, really we want to, and there will be um, a slide upcoming where we, let's say, um, cover all of us these different areas of a full value chain. Yeah? Because the aim eventually is um, to have a full integrated, um, let's say, um, um, commercially viable system in place that really fulfills social needs. Yeah? So the Safir Met, the Met of course stands for medical and we um, are demonstrating five use cases that are medically oriented. And so you see also uh, parties like the Red Cross, and there are a few hospital groups in there. I used to, believe it or not, manage a hospital group. So we have some uh, background into that and that led to, let's say, the definition of, uh, uh, let's say, specification. And that's, by the way, what my company does. We actually manage a specification and we try to cut that all in pieces and to find partners. Each of them can actually fulfill a component and together we fulfill uh, a societal market need. That brings us to the five objectives uh, of Sefermet. So 
indeed, the need is at ground level. It's, uh, let's say, urban related often. Population lives in uh, cities. That's why a new UN project, like the call that we answered, eh, all of us answered, eh, this is a UN uh, related uh, demonstration uh, project call, um, is important. Our first objective is to say, okay, what is the, uh, let's say, what are the needs and, and, what and also will be the role of actually urban cities uh, into there. One third of all hospitals are owned by cities, just for information. So that's there also there is some other link there for us very important. The second two objectives are related to actually uh, social impact. Uh, one looking at the safety aspect of it all, eh, so to improve infrastructure to ensure safety so that it's uh, socially acceptable. And the uh, third uh, rule uh, is actually looking at the sustainability, the environmental side to be indeed also societal beneficial. The fourth one is then especially to get demonstrations into the air to really um, showcase, and that was uh, a key item, um, uh, and let's say urban air mobility services, and also to apply to a service model. And the service model is again this ecosystem that we want to put in place, like how will we actually deliver, um, uh, let's say, these um, amount aviation-based services uh, into a market, right? Uh, together, and the word is together, the word is ecosystem-based. And then the fifth one is, of course, around dissemination. We've done a lot. Now we also have to bring it to the, uh, let's say, the wider audience, and we have to make sure that in the end, when we have figured out eventually, yeah, someday all our technical issues, that actually there is actu a society that will accept us. Yeah? So we have to continuously demonstrate that that's where also we were very happy yeah, to support as you in, in a very yeah, in a key initiative to communicate. And uh, well, this is the building where on the 2nd of June we'll actually have a demonstration um, and a an, an dissemination event. And these are also, by the way, the five uh, partners, the, the uh, drone partners that we will be um, operating. The next thing is then, okay, where will things happen? So we have, first of all, actually next week, uh, we'll have um, uh, flights. Uh, we're doing hundreds of flights, by the way, eh? spread around over the full project. But next week, we'll bring it together and we'll do a joint de-risking um, of these flights to demonstrate specific scenarios around use space. Eh? You've all had probably a lot of, uh, followed a lot of presentations about use space. So no need, no need to go into there, but that is actually what we really want to prove, yeah? that um, these services can help us uh, create a safe environment where the different, uh, let's say, uh, flight operations can take place. Um, then we have uh, two, let's say, uh, city-related um, demonstrations. The first is uh, in Belgium, Antwerp, Mechelen area, where we'll do, um, let's say, the, the demonstration of these use spaces also in that area. And then there's a second one, the MAL region. I don't know if you have heard of that acronym. It's uh, Maastricht, Aachen, Hasselt, Heerle, and Liège. So it's actually three countries, uh, uh, cities from three countries that are together. And we'll do flights uh, in Aachen and Heerle. Um, always related to medical actors, by the way, in those cities. And then also in uh, Czech Republic and Greece, we have specifically for Prague and Athens also evaluated what our use space setup would mean in those environments. And to do simulations there to also have, let's say, a wide learning effect um, um, uh, of, of, of all the, the concepts that we're actually developing as part of this project. Um, the, oops, there's an error in the air. Um, Actually, now looking at the architecture, and yeah. so normally you start on the left side with all the main actors, but I'll start on the right hand side, which is the consumer, right? So there were some pointers in different sessions looking at customer side, and I think this is very important. So actually, uh, I already mentioned that Elucas yeah, we're looking at creating a specification and managing that, and that's coming from we have 45 hospitals, for example, that are our customers and that we want to serve service. So they, let's say, make an order, an order entry, after themselves following a full accreditation process of getting an order out, by the way. Uh, so that's a, a full, uh, let's say, business on the, on the right hand side in which we're heavily involved. Um, um, and then we have to, of course, execute. And execution is done uh, in the air with, in our case, five uh, OEMs, uh, um, manufacturers, drone manufacturers. And the key point is that actually we have only one operator because we don't want to focus on that. We want to focus on the scenarios that we all together do and uh, refer to the ecosystem. So each of us has a specific item to do. So those five operators, they want to hinge, so, sorry, those five manufacturers rather, want to hinge into a, a system that each takes care of itself. So we have done a lot of interfacing work, but it 
and then start at each speciality. Um, and then we go into the uh, USSPs, the US based service providers, who actually will provide us a series of services. And again, these interfaces, uh, you see how lean we keep them to make them available to all participants, and they're supported always by, uh, let's say, technology companies. Eh? And so I've also put the names because this is important for us that not only the manufacturers, but all different entities that provide their pieces that we built all together are put, um, uh, let's say, forward and that can each develop and, and mature. Eh? So we're all learning, all sharing um, these things. And actually we have next to the physical world, we have put in a simulation world. So actually a second operator, of course, it's just an instance, another instance of the same command and control center that we operate, um, where actually we have a drone simulator coupled, and that will actually provide also volume into, uh, let's say, the, um, the system, and will so we can, we can let's say, uh, um, simulate a wider, more realistic environment. And then we have, and <laughs> I think, Jonas, you showed a bit the architecture, so not talk about common information service provider. Actually, an image from the future because it's being developed <laughs> as we speak. But okay, we've put it into there as a just an aggregator, um, a quality stamp that actually puts them together a lot of um, information and also user interaction with other partners that are in the game as well. Um, and then, of course, we've got the Mant Aviation world with which we have to, uh, let's say, collaborate in the same environment. This image, just to emphasize what I think Sefermet is very strong in, is team team spirit to actually, together with the different partners, work into one operation, right? So this is not something we do, a few partners work there, a few there and there. It's all in the same flow and we do all things together and we learn from each other and we have, like now, we are actually, I think we're the specialist on uh, multi-crew coordination, yeah? Because that's what we do, we do it all together. Yeah? To finalize, and this is my last slide. So, okay, the, com the central command and control center is important because many interfaces come together. So it's all about order intakes from all our medical uh, community customers. Um, 44 partner hospitals are in this game, the Red Cross, and so blood international organizations that are specifically, let's say, um, faced with challenges for which they have quality problems, for which actually they need better solutions in order to save lives. Yeah, let's be very uh, key on that. And I, I, I very much loved uh, this morning at nine o'clock, there was this uh, session with EASA, where actually the, the balance eh, um, was uh, made like, okay, we put the safety level extremely high, which is correct, it's the aviation world. At the same time, our solution will save lives. So the more we put up the barrier, the slower will, of course, be able to implement and the more difficult and, and, and the more expensive, therefore, the less usage, but then actually will be saving less life on this side. So the question that came up eh, through the audience, Slido, uh, was um, like, is there a maybe sp a specific uh, model that can be applied for um, socially and, and let's say life-saving missions? Yeah? Like the ambulance, eh, the example was given, I think you gave it, the ambulance that um, actually can cross a red light yeah, under certain circumstances eh, with a red light and alarm siren. Maybe we could also arrange something like that in the air. And then I think the reply from our side, and we were also in the same panel, and our operation set was with you, uh, replied like, look, we can actually um, apply a certain um, prioritization model, right? And, and, and highlight when with <laughs> the, uh, let's say the uh, analogy with the, the, the siren and the, the, the <coughs> flashlight could also work here. So that's um, on order intake. We have already spoken, the five platforms, multi-UA fleet. We have the USSP providing the US based services from three countries. Yeah? So we're uh, so that's that's a bit that spider uh, sitting there, but actually giving a lot of ins and outs. Uh, the next one, um, unfortunately, operational authorization is a very important one. I think, honestly, we spent 80% of our time just on that topic, uh, just to get ourselves in the air. Um, yes, to create a Sora for very different platforms and so on. Okay, we have luckily only one operator. That one operator will use Article 13 to go to eh, from Belgium to Germany and to the Netherlands. So that simplifies a lot the work for the full consortium. We don't have to do it again and again for every different platform and, and so on. So it's that's um, an advantage. And therefore, we also have a very good view where we are. And yes, we <laughs> have some challenges. Yeah? We know that then as well. Um, operator organization, 
of course, we need to have an operations manual in place, safety management system. Actually, we need it. Um, strong procedures, incident reporting. We just did last week some tests, and yes, we had an incident, but it was reported correctly, and the countermeasure physically was created, and the countermeasure for next week is in place. So I'm like, this is important. This is the aviation world, trust-based um, community that shares issues and solves them and then goes on. You know, This is, I think, very important. Um, from and, and something we should take over from manned aviation, surely. We should not lose that trust-based, um, let's say, environment. No, no guild-based culture. Uh, formal training, and uh, we have uh, syllabus and classes that are given for, indeed, this multi-crew coordination that's going on. Uh, uh, Multi-companies are uh, actually executing Bivolov, Bivolov's missions. It's quite, quite interesting. And then also the ground mitigation, emergency response plan. We have, I mentioned uh, cities, we have had strong interaction with each commune where we will fly over and um, it takes some time but and but they involve all of a sudden you're sitting in a in a in a room with 20 city areas that are res represented very keen to learn and in the end it's always without exception has been a positive result yeah so this is also very good but the key point was they always uh, say oh we thank you that you come up front and we don't have to find this out afterwards so this was a very good one and also on the emergency response plan. I, I know that in the SORA there's we can win a point there if we have got a high mitigation level there. This is, I think, important because even if something happens, I mean, with a good ERP, it's like in the ground world, you solve the issue. Yeah? If you create a new, but you can solve it quickly, well, this, this is increases overall safety. Um, overall impact, I would say, yeah, the impact. Um, then uh, technologies we used, uh, so of course USB services, this is a key key point, uh, uh, the mandatory ones, um, the optional ones, I think they were also uh, often discussed. Detect and avoid um, is a specific one where we have put in place, and, and actually it's a, a new technology that we pretty much developed um, as part of um, this project, um, where we have traffic information coming in, and that is evaluated, so we look 45 seconds ahead, we can we can predict whether there is a, a collision course or not, and we can, within the geospace of, uh, let's say, an individual drone, do the aviation. And this is valid for all of our drones, because it's you know centrally available from the ground. So that's even, because we know sensor-based uh, detect and avoid is is coming, it's important, but this one is very complementary in a Swiss cheese safety model. Uh, we have um, mission prioritization, I just mentioned that already, it's already covered as a technology, as a, as a concept, but still it's a technology. And then yes, I al also already mentioned, we apply new EU regulations, uh, 945, 947, and especially Article 13 to get into the other countries, and I think the CAs are very keen to see well how will that work, and the ASA as well, I guess. Yeah. So I think that's a bit um, to conclude, yes, please visit us also on safir-met.eu or myself um, if you would like to have some more information. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Michael. Much appreciated. So, my final speaker today. Uh, you may have noticed that most of the, uh, many of the speakers are involved around our new space projects have come from small companies, from, um, from, from SMEs, and this is fantastic. We get a new influx of innovation. But we, we mustn't forget there's also a place in what we do for some of the more established companies. So, so my final speaker I'd like to introduce you today is Petr Sazek from Honeywell. Um, I'm more used to working with Petr on, on, on the big main core ATM projects, but I'm very, very pleased to welcome him today to talk us about new space for UAM, the project he's running on. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, uh, welcome, and, and thanks, thanks a lot for in being invited to this panel, and uh, I would like to introduce another very large demo uh, project uh, running in the same kind of time frame like uh, the project that you just heard about. So starting the, the last year and co uh, more or less finishing the end of this year. Uh, so uh, as it is very large demo project, obviously the most visible kind of outcome of the project are the demos. However, I would like to emphasize on uh, from our perspective, the project has a bit broader scope. So demonstration you can use to demonstrate the feasibility based on the state of our technology or, or and, and showing what we can do with the technology now. Essentially, what we would like uh, and, uh, to be the, the kind of complementary and equally important uh, outcome of the project is to identify what are the gaps to have the bi sufficiently strong business case on of the operations. One thing is to demonstrate that we can perform them with the current technology. The second is, if we use the solutions based on the current technology, is the business case sufficiently strong? Isn't it, is it affordable? 
does it make sense to deploy these this services? So essentially, this is why we think it is, uh, it is quite important already at this stage start to identify, it. okay, these are really the, the, uh, the issues that we need to overcome. We need to find the different solution in order that it will be really deployed. So, so I wanted to emphasize this, this aspect. So beyond the, the really the demonstrations showing the, uh, what we can do, uh, really predict and, and propose the way forward, essentially how to make it business viable and, and therefore accelerate the deployment. So uh, again, it's very large scale demo project. We have 13 partners. Also taking into account this objective, we have uh, large competencies mixing a lot of industry. We have different uh, um, manufacturers of the vehicles. We have uh, air navigation service provider from different countries. We have uh, U-Space or UTM uh, service provider. We have research institution uh, and uh, also several operators of the drone. So Again, a large competency, which is obviously necessary to perform the, the project of this type. So, so, so uh, what is our uh, essentially approach to the demo? So, um, as, as uh, uh, Robin said at the, at the start, really the purpose of this uh, round of the of the of the demonstration project is to to show that uh, you, uh, you, we have deployed U U1 U2 services. Uh, or core services as, as formulated by ESA regulation. We have it in place and demonstrate how they can support the operations and, and ideally go a bit above. So this is exactly what we try to do. So uh, we, with our partners, identify the, uh, the interesting use cases for each of the, of the, of the, of the partners or of the OEM or operator. Based on this, build the kind of nominal scenarios in which we assume the deployment of this core and U1, U2 services. But then build for the demonstration the scenario which goes beyond and essentially the element which is necessary is under the tactical conflict, uh, tactical conflict management. So but essentially all our demos try to target the situation when something don't go as well as expected for the strat during the strategic deconfliction and show how we can react on this and as Honeywell, of course, avionics producer, uh, we have a lot of industry building the, the vehicles. We are looking quite a lot how the use space services are complemented with the capability on the vehicle and how they can essentially coordinate uh, uh, interplay between them in solving the, the situations which were not predicted in advance. So uh, we have uh, uh, five demos, but uh, four of them are flight demos. One, one is the simulations. So two of them are the drones operating in the urban environment. Two of them are if tall uh, vehicles uh, saying, as, as, I, as I explained, when building the nominal scenario, we started from the real business use case that we want to target. Of course, when we go to the fly demos, we need to adapt to the uh, what type of operational approval we can get, what is the, especially for the IFTOL, which are uh, going to be certified vehicles, uh, which are not fully certified at this moment, so we have a, a strong limitation. So uh, then the scenario, which are really flown, uh, have a reduced scope in this context and focus really on the capability that we want, uh, more on the situation that we want to demonstrate. Uh, and we decided to complement it with uh, operational simulations when, uh, where we will simulate the, how the business, how these uh, business use cases would be flown really. So how we did it, uh, uh, we have uh, used the Honeywell cockpit simulator, uh, which is in, in, in Czech Republic to simulate uh, IFTOL operations, including the, the pilot uh, interacting with high automated vehicle. We connected it remotely to the in-air ATC simulator, so we have interaction with the ATC and we can handle the situation. Essentially also when there is the manned aircraft which interfere with the U-space environment or on the opposite. Uh, and, uh, somehow complement the, the flight demos where we showed the, the technologies uh, in, in the real world and uh, I think physically, physically present with this type of simulation, uh, with which such type of exercise and showing 
focusing on the operation aspect without being limited essentially by the current regulation limitations and what, what you are allowed to do. So this is kind of approach. So uh, we have essentially uh, uh, one if all demo with vertical using day vehicle, which will be performed in UK and focus quite a lot on the vertiport operations, very relevant to the previous session. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, another demo with Technalia in Spain, which will be in uh, Atlas environment, uh, experimental environment, which will simulate like the flight from airport to the city. Uh, and uh, also with the strong involvement in air, we will look a, a lot on the, for instance, operational aspects of the corridors and, 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 and interaction. And there will be also kind of non-cooperative intrude detected by the onboard sensor. <laughs> uh, and showing, showing how the onboard, onboard detect and avoid can react on this. Uh, by the way, in vertical, in vertiport, even if it's very, imp uh, it's not considered like the probable scenario, we have also the drone which intervene the vertiport area, and we have the vehicle reacting on this. Uh, and then we have the two two drones operations which are really uh, s s kind of demonstrating the, the operations doing for the city authorities, like the monitoring or emergency emergency situation kind of monitoring or. Uh, and uh, one uh, in Czech Republic, which is kind of very similar to the <laughs> Safir Met, so, so essentially uh, uh, bringing the um, samples between the uh, hospital and, and the laboratory. So uh, just could last uh, <laughs> conclusion. Most of this demo will happen between the May and August of this year. So you can imagine we are now in the <laughs> really intensive period of preparing all of them. So uh, I should use the future <laughs> statement in, in this context, but uh, hopefully in the next type of events, we, will be, uh, we can show really the, the results of the, of the demos. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Patrick. That concludes our um, the formal part of the, uh, the, the presentation. What I'd like to do now is to ask each of you for just a few words, please, on, on what are we doing here? I mean, eSpace is solved, right? We've seen it. The regulation has been published. eSpace is there. Why are we still researching? Why are we demonstrating? So please, I'll start with you, Andrew. Please let me know why we're still here. Yeah, so we did some use space experiments before and, and we got some flights going, but we're still a long way from practical implementation. I mean, a lot of people have a lot to learn. We have to figure out how to make this work with a larger number of flights. We need to make it work under a larger range of conditions. One of the good things about the Chorus XUAM project with its six demonstrations is we're looking at different combinations of things. In the example in the Barcelona area, we had nine simultaneous aircraft, including police and other actors. In, in the Belgian demonstration, we'll have uh, emergency response. So we're looking at different problems, and we're looking at them with a, a greater intensity than previous demonstrations. As, as you said, very large demonstration is bigger than what we had before. We had demonstrations before. Uh, and we're making progress. Oops in terms of making this uh, repeatable and more like real life. But we, we still have more to learn about the difficulty of solving these pro real problems. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it, it's in the details. I think it's when, when we go, go out there and we do it and we connect the dots and we find you know, what, does, what does work and what doesn't work. There's one element which I talked about, the connectivity, and connecting different entities together. You know, it's not just about the systems, it's about the people and, and the people and the workflow you're used to. So you run into things like, oh, I didn't think about it this way. I did yeah. this one before the other one. Uh, and y you know, everything from, oh, you s you, you, your, your, your systems are, are pinging me too often, so you get blacklisted by the firewall. And this is, these are the kind of insights we need. We need yeah. that level yeah. of insight to, and disseminate it for us to be able to interconnect on a scalable and easy way, so we don't have to reinvent the yeah. wheel. And that's, uh, that's, that's one element of it. And, and, and then we have the functionality of the use space services. Andrew was leading the AMC and GM work on the, on the flight authorization for use space regulation. 
and deconfliction, strategic deconfliction before you take off. So we, we tested that one. Okay, we have this algorithm that if there's a, a conflict for deconflict and we fire a flight plan, the flight plan is for a two hour flight and it's uh, five kilometers away, but the takeoff and landing is at the same time as the other guy doing the five minute flight, but he waits now for two hours before because the other guy is five kilometers away, but the operation plan is not split into parts. So now we saw, okay, that didn't work. It didn't take a long discussion to see that that, that doesn't work, but how to make the segmentation of flight plans? I was asking Andrew, so what's the maximum size of that one? And the answer was we couldn't agree. So now we need to demonstrate and find out. Over to Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Johan. No, I think, yeah, content-wise, use space services, there's still a lot to do. Um, a lot has been designed, but needs to be implemented, tested, and redesigned, probably, right? And then re-implemented. So this is an iterative process. We are, um, in aviation terms, going very fast. Of course, from the use case perspective, from society, we're going, of course, very slow, because um, there is a need. And that's the positive side of things. There is a need, but we have to get a solution out there. And actually, this type of projects that um, let's say, showcase these and test these um, use space services help a lot of structuring um, the solution. And that's why eh, I was referring to, let's say, an ecosystem that together has pieces that will solve this. That's actually what we're finding out, like how together can we actually fulfill these use space services uh, that are being designed as we speak. Eh? Uh, so yes, I think we still have uh, a lot of use um, to clarify more, to do this iterative uh, process and to probably have even more uh, demonstration uh, projects that actually can continue this type of, of iterative um, interaction between lawmaker and then the, the market and the, uh, let's say, the, the, the all the ecosystem partners. Thank you, Michael. Peter? Okay, uh, well, I would say a part of the thing I mentioned when presenting Space for UM, I think even on the use space side, there is still a lot of work, and I think we, are, and especially on this tactical conflict, uh, really going from the strategic pre-flight to, to, to solving uh, in real time a situation during the flight. The second aspect, which I would mention, uh, when we will start to fly, thinking really about the complementarity of the airborne capabilities and the, and the use space services, and things how to combine them optimally. As, uh, Typically for uh, urban air mobility operations, the, the vehicles will cross a lot of airspaces. The, uh, the level of support on the services may and will probably vary across the, the type of airspaces. So thinking essentially what, what the, the vehicle really needs to have equipped themselves in order that it complements and it can scale depending on the, on the level of support that they received in the different type of airspace, I think it is important. And then there will be, um, uh, engineers like this term, there will be a lot of implementation details once you start to implement yeah. such systems, <laughs> which will pop up and you cannot avoid it, so, <laughs> yeah. Inevitable. Thank you very much indeed. Now I'd like to zoom in on, a, on one thing that was mentioned, I, I, I by several of you in fact, um, and it's kind of the elephant in the room, which I really would like to, to probe into. Uh, briefly, we have 13 minutes left. Um, um, maybe I could ask Jonas to start. Um, a key element of a demonstration is demonstrating. We're supposed to be flying things, not um, just you know, simulating or, 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 the or theorizing about it. Um, in as real an environment as you're able to manage. Now, to do that, of course, you need to follow the rules. Um, how difficult has it been to get flight authorizations to enable the demonstrations to actually happen? Thank you for the question. A bit of background. So, Robots Expert, we, we do safety work. We do SORA consulting. We train pilots. We are deep into this one, understanding the design verification pr procedures, even if we're not yet engaged with one for the reasons I come to, to, to shortly. But we've done, we worked in 2019 with SORA because traffic on the Finnish CAA was part of Jaro, uh, so, and they wanted those SORA safety cases already at that time. So, we've done over 20 SORAs. What we found out, we said, wave one, we gonna any beyond visual on the side flying in a populated area, we're gonna simulate that. We're not gonna do it physically. We don't have time in the beginning of the project to do the safety cases. And then we engaged with with, with um, EASA in the fall of last year of, of getting flight authorizations for sale three for doing it. And we have um, manufacturers who have thousands of flight hours, you know, military standard drone manufacturing, <coughs> been flying, you know, over ad ad advanced environments. They all, one after each other, backed off. We're gonna, not going to pursue this because 
The main reason is that when we go up now in complexity with the, with the risk assessment and the flight authorization, it's an exponential curve. To, if you do a sale too, the authority fees are in the hundreds of the euros. And today we heard that if, if you design verify your parachute, the ESA fee is in the 20,000 of euros. So you have a hundredfold increase in cost, but you don't have a hundredfold increase in value add from that kind of, uh, of, of, of operation. We should remember we are competing with a tram. We are competing with helicopter. If I pay 30,000, I can buy a used Cessna and I can do these flights in unsecurated airspace. So we have the expectation from the drone and eVTOL community is that we are about cutting costs, enabling operations more efficiently, more automation, and cutting, taking cost out of the equation. Whereas a lot of the work we do with the regulation is now being formed, and there's a lot of expectation to be able to get more income from all of this. So one curve is going up, the other curve is diminishing returns from more advanced operations, and the equation both are right, but they don't consolidate at the moment. So yeah. at the moment, the, the situation in Gov2 is that we are going to do sale 2 and we're going to do more simulation because nobody committed to do anything beyond, you know, BV loss in populated yeah. environment remains something for the big boys with deep, deep pockets. And one of the clear messages that I will not forget, one of the uh, players said, I can choose by putting 500 or 300 hours of my engineers on ensuring regulatory compliance or I can spend that effort on developing uh, our platforms and developing our capabilities. And it did, wasn't, and when, if I do the certification or design verification, I'm gonna have design verify yesterday's model, whereas my customers are wanting to have the next model. Mm -hmm. So it becomes an opportunity cost. And for the right kind of application, it's there, but for the vast majority, we, we need to have more understanding of how to solve this conundrum of taking crawl, walk, run, because now we are going from crawl to run, and it's a leap of faith financially. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm sure we could um, talk in depth with all the projects on this one, but in the interest of breadth and coverage, I'd like to uh, move on to you, Michael, maybe, um, and say that um, the demonstrations of UAM bring with it a slight a different feel to the other use space demonstrations in that we are working over a city and we can't operate over a city without the the full cooperation of the city authorities i know that in the case of safi med you've been working very closely as you mentioned in your presentation perhaps you'd like to expand just a little on on what you had to do with the authorities to enable your demonstrations yeah um yeah, we, indeed, um, Robin, we had several interactions with uh, authorities at local level. Um, on the, the first interaction was that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, quite a few hospitals are actually um, owned um, by, by um, the cities. Um, and uh, through those, we actually had very early involvement through the board of directors actually with cities. Um, and uh, next to that, of course, there's a generic uh, mobility um, how to see question out there at cities. And of course, they look also to the third dimension to say like, okay, can we get some help from there? Because more and more society wants the cities uh, in the center to be traffic free, um, but still wants to get <laughs> to have people live there, meaning they need services, they need goods and so on. So that's like, okay, can, can drones maybe help? So from two, two sides in our case we got influx uh, of city interest and then also of course there is the full um, question like you know aviation was always uh, out there far away yeah 10,000 feet high it's a bit invisible from the ground but as we <laughs> come closer uh, and fly closer to the cities and all of a sudden like you know the cities are uh, faced with that element, not only the cities that have an airport right next to the or in the city and have some issues there, but now it's, let's say, a more um, large scale thing. And that's why we did indeed, eh, one of our objectives of the project was find out what's now going on and should we, do we have an issue with cities or do we have actually uh, a friend uh, there? And it's actually very clearly the second one. And so we see and we also, you know, um, well, so I can really um, uh, testify that we have a lot of positive interest from that local authority level. Um, at the same time, uh, the uh, let's say the point, eh, Jonas, that you just made, like um, what will the full thing cost? And I've I've um, something that I've not heard at all, but in a previous session came about, like ah, cities are maybe expecting some revenue 
some taxation from this overflight. Actually, none of the cities I've been in contact with has actually asked that. Yeah, and um, so I cannot testify that at all. Mm. But I'm a bit fearful now, <laughs> <laughs> now that I heard that, <laughs> because of course, like uh, Jonas, you correctly pointed out, we are really. I mean, we're on the on the um, uh, the use case side, and 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 yes, there is some budget there to pay for these services. But but it's you know it's it's all limited. Uh, we in the medical world we have uh, quali. Uh, uh, let's say what's the, the um, basically the cost of an additional life year saved, right? So that's a fixed amount. Yeah, I can tell you it's in in, in Europe it's fifty thousand euro. So if you develop something and it costs more than fifty thousand euro and the benefit is one life year saved by application of that, it will not be funded. Yeah, a European. Um, let's say um, social system will not fund it because there are better solutions that will cost less to also save that additional year and the budget is limited. Right? We already spent 10% of our um, let's say European wide uh, budget on healthcare and it can hardly increase. Right? I know the the US spends 17% but the doctors cost five times more than the average European wage but whatever uh, because uh, they have to take expensive um, assurance, uh, legal, uh, let's say, um, insurances. But no, the, 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 the key point being that it's a trade-off. And we, we and that's also why I mentioned the trade-off in safety. And, and, and that sounds a bit strange in an aviation world. We always go for maximum safety and we, okay, where can we lead? How can we achieve that, etc. But the medical world is very different. We are faced by people in problems and we and it's always triage when you go to a first emergency service when there is a trauma when there's a accident the doctors the first doctors go out there it's not all about immediately helping someone no 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 they look at okay i've got 20 patients here which one will i help and which one sorry will i not help and and this is this quality aspect in in true form because that's that's unfortunately where we are and this is not very much known outside of the medical world but that's that's what they have to encounter but actually in economic terms this is the same thing the same type of trade-offs that we do without knowing it right without no by putting a price on our services we're automatically saying we're not helping everyone and this is something maybe to take into account um, and, uh, and that's links to the urban setting like how can we help these cities as well eh, with our okay. solutions that we design eh? Two sides of a balance. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're raring in at the end. Before I ask the final question, I, I'd like to ask. I wonder, is there any question from anybody in the room, a burning question they'd like to ask now without using Slido? Anyone like to raise a particular question? No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, just so just to round, to round up here. Um, Andrew, very briefly, um, we've had many demonstrations over the years and it's easy to get focused on your own demonstration and think that's the, the, the solving the problems of the universe but of course it isn't is it so one of the rules you've had is coordination maybe you'd like to show how we try to coordinate between projects so in in the start of this program there were six projects set up uh, and in at the beginning they were independent but quite quickly it became clear uh, that the aim of my project to produce uh, second version of the the concept of operations it would be futile if we didn't take into account the discoveries and learnings of, of the other projects so uh, with Cengiz who's sitting here and my uh, some other colleagues we set up a thing called the CONOPS coordination cell and we're now working with the other demonstration projects with a number of research projects and we're collecting together the insights into how does use space have to change in order to accommodate all of our needs and we're looking particularly for conflicting ideas, which we have to try and resolve. But this coordination cell is running. We're hoping to have some kind of public event towards the end of the year. And uh, you should hear from us, um, maybe not in the version of the CONOPS I'm working on at the moment, but for the version which we produce at the end of the project, there'll be plenty of input from the coordination cell recorded there. That's good to hear, and I'm sure we'll be publicising that through the SESAR website in due course. Thank you very much. Um, time has defeated us. Um, I'm sure we could talk about this for, um, I, well, I certainly could, for a, a lot longer, but I'll spare you that. Um, thank you all very much for taking the, the trouble to come and join us today. I hope you found something of interest in what the SESAR programme is doing to try and bring about the turning um, SESAR, turning uh, the youth space and UEM concepts in Europe from theory to reality. All that remains for me to do is to, to thank the speakers, Andrew, Jonas, Michael, Peter, 
for joining me, for providing with your insights and your, 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 your experiences from these exciting demonstrations. Keep your um, eyes pinned to the website. We will, there are open days and public demonstrations that form part of many of these projects where you'll start to see some of these concepts becoming a reality. So thank you all very much indeed for coming in this first exciting face-to-face -face since the COVID has prevented us from doing it. I'm delighted that you were here and I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been my pleasure. Robin Garrity from the Cesar JU. Goodbye to you all. Thank you.